My name is Monk Rowe, and we're at Hamilton College. I'm extremely pleased to have David Murray with me for the Jazz Archive. Well, I'm pleased to be here, Monk, because this is, uh, this is where I want to be, with, with all the greats. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I scarcely know where to start with you because you've done so many different kinds of things, and I'm curious if you've always had a very strong curiosity about all kinds of music. Oh, um, yeah, certainly. Um, when I was younger, um, I started out in gospel music. I remember the day I got my saxophone. Uh, Phil Hardyman, he came into the system in the Berkeley, Berkeley, uh, not Berkeley, California school system. Mm -hmm. um, he's the one who handed me my alto, and uh, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, great trumpet player Phil Hardyman. He's, he's the one who was really responsible for bringing jazz into the Berkeley school system. And so that night I played the saxophone at church. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure I was squeaking and sounding very strange, very much like I sound now, but I had no idea what I was doing. Um, my mother was, had, was playing piano, my brother on clarinet, my cousin playing trumpet, and my father was playing guitar. Um, I knew the songs, but I didn't know the fingerings, but I was working on it. A few weeks later, I blended right in. You know, I had been playing bongos with them for like, mm. you know, a couple of years already, you know, but at nine, that was where I was, and I had been taking piano lessons for two years already with a uh, stride piano player that my mother put me with. So, um, and it was always with me, it was always wh wherever I was, I felt comfortable there, but I also yearned to play other things. I, I strived to uh, to get out of church music. In fact, because uh, you know, we were we were the church band, we played every night or well, three nights a week at least, and all day Sunday. And after a while, you know, I'm a young man, I'm a teenager. I, I want to get out. I want to play gigs. I want to do different. I want to play blues gigs. So I'm I'm starting to go out and do these kind of things. Um, I grew up very st in a very strict uh, Church of God in Christ environment where. Mm -hmm. Playing or practicing jazz in our house was forbidden. So um, I had to go out to my friends' places to practice and play that kind of music. Um, after my mother passed away when I was 13, uh, things became a little looser because mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's, it's uh, three boys and a father and no mother. Mm -hmm. And um, he couldn't watch us all the time. So. I started bringing my things in the house, and next thing you know, my father got a little looser as in terms of the devil's music and what what, what I could p play at, at home. And at a certain point, I even had the guys over for rehearsal. So that's how loose yeah. it became after my mother had passed away. So um, I always yearned to play um, other styles. So I'm playing R and B now, and um, and also I'm, I'm coming from Berkeley, California, so. In order to play gigs, you have to know a lot of rep a, a large repertoire. Um, also, rock and roll. You have to know how to appease the people on Berkeley campus. Uh, we're playing for a lot of uh, parties and different things that you see Berkeley, things like that. So we played all of the all of the um, the, the rock material. We played, and Grateful Dead was there. We played that stuff. This um, have been late '60s. Yeah, this, we're talking like 68, mm -hmm. 67, 68, 69, you know, I'm, um, I'm 12, 13, and 14, and, you know, I'm 15 in, in 1970 when yeah. Jimi Hendrix died. So this was a very crucial period for me. Um, in fact, um, I probably could describe myself as a, a hippie Black Panther you know, on the political side and in the, on the music side. Uh, psychedelic uh, kind of a jazz, kind of a blues, kind of a bluegrass kind of guy. You got it surrounded. Yeah, you know, yeah. Berkeley is a hell of a place to grow up. I mean, I, I used to play so. guitar on Telegraph Avenue and wish I was Jimi Hendrix, too. Mm. So that was another phase of me. Yeah. And I'm in, I'm in the middle of all, all of the riots in Berkeley, and all the peace movements there, and all of the Black Panther things as well. So, you know, Berkeley is a hell of a place. It's right next to Oakland, but it's quite different.
Yeah, I spent, uh, I was there last August just to, it's something at the college actually yeah. or something, and I, I can imagine that would have been a very fertile and stimulating environment. Well, you know, it's the only city that, that spoke up against the war in, in Afghanistan, for instance, and they got a lot of flack from the rest of the United States for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the only city that stood out. In fact, they wanted to they wanted to, to bring harm to the city council because they, because they were against the war, you know. But uh, Berkeley is a special place, and I'm proud to, to mm -hmm. have come from there. And I, one day I'll, be, I'll go back there because I think it's a paradise kind of a place, and, and the thought process is very free. Let me just go back for a second to the, the connection between the church music and what you aspired to. It's interesting what you were playing in the church had to be somewhat improvised as, well, as far as your role. Of it. course, uh, me being a, you know, like a single instrument, um, my role was to improvise and to make it hot and to, and, and, to phrase, and to phrase melodies when people, sometimes in church people, um, they'll start off a song, um, and my mother was very good at this. Uh, they start a song out in about three different keys. Uh, they say, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord, you know, and somewhere in, the, in there, somewhere in there, you got to determine which key you're going to play in. Mm -hmm. And my mother was very good at that, and, and, okay. and just, just, just nailing it from, yeah. from the onset. And She'd get the best yeah. of, the strongest, <laughs> the strongest tone they sang, she would, that, she'd make that the center. I see. And uh, I got good at it too <laughs> after a while, but, uh, uh, and that also, there was a lot of ear training going on there, because mm. you know, people, they come to church to sing, and 99% and of them can't sing at all, but they have a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> so. Uh, but, you know, the, the idea that you're playing improvised music, but you can't play jazz. Your, your mother didn't like that. What well, was as the long as I was playing the church music and improvising, it wasn't considered jazz. Mm -hmm. You know, um, like, I mean, I was getting into John Coltrane and Sonny Rollins and all these people, and I was putting that into the church. They didn't know I was, it was really getting into that. All they knew was that as long as I could play the church melodies, fine. Whatever else I played was not, uh, they didn't care. They didn't even know if it was jazz or not. They didn't care, but they knew that it was good. And, but they knew that when it came to playing that melody that I could play it strong. Mm -hmm. That was the point. Uh, so um, I got away with that, I guess you could say. But that's, that's where I learned to improvise in the church. It's true. Did and you retain the, the faith part of, of the church? Yes. Okay. Oh yes, uh, I did. I, you know, I've um, I've experimented experimented with um, with other uh, religions, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, uh, like I guess it's like they say, uh, you, you come right back to. I, I, I could I could uh, a friend of mine in the World Saxophone Quartet. I'm not going to say who it is, but you know, he was studying to, to be a, a, a Indian religion. You know, some. Robbie, somebody, I can't remember. And uh, we were in a, a small earthquake in, in Berkeley one time, and he ran out in his underwear screaming, save me Jesus. So anyway, I, I said, well, what happened to uh, you know, the other religion thing? He said, well, I don't know. I, but you know, the fact is, you know, the way you're brought up is pretty much the way you're going to be if it's, if it's put into you the way it was put into me. Now, that's, that's my indoctrination. Uh -huh. I could go and try to study different li religions, but when it comes down to it, man, that's where I'm, 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 I'm going to go with what I know. Yeah. Mm. Was there a time uh, in your teens where you made a conscious decision that I'm going to try to be a professional musician? Uh, I had already, um, before I got in my teens, I had already determined that. Mm. That was already decided. Um, uh, when I when I seen Sonny Rollins play uh, a solo saxophone at the Berkeley Jazz Festival when I was about 11, uh, the next day I had to go get a tenor. And I guess that would have been the moment. Uh, but I, I wanted to be a musician before that, mm -hmm. but I wanted to be a tenor saxophone player after that. I see. So that that much I knew. So I asked my dad, say, you know. I got to get a tenor, so he took me to his credit union, and we worked it out. And 
I got a job and I paid for it. And I, I worked I worked gigs, you know, to pay for it. And, and over a year's time, I had I had a a, a Mark Six. You know, it was my first tenor at Mark Six. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I was I had the greatest horn in the world. And, right. You know, what would you have been paid on a typical gig back then? Twenty five dollars. Mm -hmm. If I made fifty, that was great. And yeah. But I mean, hey, I was uh, I was a kid. Um, you know, sometimes we made more than that. You know, but uh, but a gig was a gig. Fifty dollars when you're a kid is a lot of money. Indeed. So uh, we would do that, and uh, I play weekends. You know, all the way up and. I played weekends all the way up until I until I left college and came to New York. Uh, when I was at Pomona College, I, I had a gig uh, out on Foothill Boulevard. I went to Pomona College in the Claremont, and I had a gig there uh, during the weekends where I play with the organ player. We play old standards, and then uh, there was the belly dancer there, and uh, I had a soprano then, and she liked the sound of it, and. So uh, she told me just watch your navel, and I just watched your navel and played. And I improvised, and that I got paid twice when I played at the Maharaja because uh, because of her. She she wanted because she was the middle act, mm -hmm. and so I played on the beginning act and the middle act, and there was a third act, and uh, then they would repeat it again, yeah. and uh, that helped me. You know, music has always been a way to to make a living, also. Mm -hmm. That was also very important to me that I make a living um, playing music because I've never, I've never done anything else. I've never had a, a job, a real gig. gig. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was important for me never to. I, I never wanted one. I mean, I used to sign shine shoes and wash dishes when I was a kid. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean uh, when I became, a, you know, in my later teens and an adult. I never had a job mm -hmm. other than music. And I never wanted another job that, that wouldn't entail music. Did you get involved uh, even beyond the music with the civil rights scene in Berkeley and kind of social activism? Well, uh, in Berkeley, um, well, there was, there was a thing with uh, Bobby Seale running for the mayor of Oakland and then the recall of the Army Bailey. Uh, I, I participated on, on, on both of those as a student. Um, I, I, I wasn't sure what you said, recall of? Of the Army Bailey. He, he, was, oh. he was with the city council of Berkeley, okay. and uh, he had gotten into a little trouble. Uh, he was involved with the Black Panthers, and you know he had gotten involved with the police, and uh, they wanted to recall him from his position on the city council. So uh, I was on that committee to, to help him. Uh, anyway, um, I wasn't, um, I, I guess I really didn't get real political uh, until I went to college. I think that's the time. Well, although, although, uh, when I was very young, uh, like 12, and, no, 13, when I was 13, um, was in 68, uh, during the People's Park thing. Um, I think Ronald Reagan was the governor, and they had a problem there with, uh, with the county sheriffs because they were using buckshot. And they also had a problem because they dropped tear gas into the Willard Junior High School, and I was the president of the student body there. And um, what actually what happened was they missed People's Park from the helicopter, they, they, they missed diagnosed uh, the fact that there was five blocks in the same area of blocks but further up Telegraph Avenue towards South Gate. Well, it was here, People's Park's here, South Gate's there. So I guess they missed. Mm -hmm. And they dropped tear gas on 12 and 13 year olds. And uh, we, had to, we had to turn the school out and we had to let it out. And of course, all the students were angry. So we all went up and joined the mob. And we all were tear gassed already. So, well, you know, so we started turning over cars, and, uh -huh. you know, so I don't know if that was political or it was just a reaction to, yeah. to the state throwing uh, tear gas on some children. I don't know. How'd your if you father call that political, I think that's just survival, yeah. perhaps. Mm. Yeah. How'd your father feel about you being involved in those kinds of things? 
even though it wasn't a conscious choice, I guess, as you said, you the circumstance kind of put you into it and you reacted. Well, my father is from the school of, uh, you know, um, civil rights uh, was very high on this list. Um, even being a, a, a staunch church man, you know, we believed in we believed in Martin Luther King, and that was the same year that Martin Luther King was killed. So um, my father was was for anything that had anything to do with with making the situation better. I mean, the fact that he moved to Berkeley and put us in a a uh, a better neighborhood than our cousins who lived in Oakland. Um, I, I remember one of the most angry times that I've ever seen him was when my brother moved into a ghetto in Oakland. He went over there and made him move out because he, he said, you don't know how many sacrifices I had to make being a garbage man and working extra jobs and doing this and that for you to live in a city like Berkeley. So why in the hell would you, would you go and live in a ghetto and put yourself at risk and now I'm going to put my other brother at, at risk because he wants to live with you. You know, you know, I've never seen him so angry. So it, it, in, in his own way, he was an activist. Mm -hmm. But not, not one that would that would join up with the Black Panthers or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But you know, just through the church, this yeah. they, you can express your anger. Uh, I think the church has been has been uh, probably the strongest. I mean, if you put it, put it down for the years and years that they persevered, the church has been the, the strongest political animal in the Black community. You know, regardless of one speaker might raise up, one may raise up and be a communist or, or this or that. But the church has always been the overriding. It, it was always the place even for them to hide mm -hmm. if they needed sanctuary. Oh. Yeah. You know, the church has always would take everybody back. And the church accepts everyone. The church is, is uh, in, in far as acceptance, it's uh, ecumenical. The church is, takes everyone. You know, our church, you know, Church of God in Christ accepts everyone. You know, there's no, there's no lock in our church. If a white man comes into our church, we're going to take him. If he's down and out, come on in here, let's get you together. And if you want to go on your way, fine. If you want to stay, you're welcome. That's, that's what church is. And to me, that's, you know, that's, that's some activism, you know, right there to me, you know. Because, Absolutely. Because... Uh, Sometimes when you, you know, after Martin and Malcolm, you get all these opportunist people, and you know, it just seems like that's that's all there is. You know, it's just they don't really want to save the community. They wanna, they wanna be known for who they are, oh. and they wanna make themselves a leader. I mean, most of the times, a good leader just comes out of the people, and that they don't have their own agenda. Yeah. For themselves. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a good leader. And that's why Martin was so great. Because he, he just rose up through his, through becoming a theologian to become you know, who he was. I mean, you know, he's a man who made his father change his name because he became a great man. When he became Martin Luther, he wasn't born Martin Luther, he was Melvin Lewis. And he, because he was a junior, mm -hmm. his dad had to change his name too. <laughs> I know. didn't know that. Yeah, a lot yeah. of people don't. But the people in Atlanta know that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about your uh, progression as a musician a little bit. You had mentioned that to get into college, you had to uh, do some woodshedding with something that James perhaps. Newton. I had to do some woodshedding okay. with James Newton uh -huh. to really get my flute chops together. You know, because I, I had a flute. I played, you know, uh, you know, Memphis Underground or something. You know, I mean, <laughs> you it was just real, real light kind really, of flute yeah. stuff. Oh, well, I mean, not yeah. light, but, yeah. you know, yeah, light. Right, well, you didn't have to have the greatest tone and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, I, was, I, 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 was no, I was no good on the flute. I, and I played piccolo in the marching band. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was no good. I was, the tenor was my M.O., you know. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I had to work on uh, I knew all my scales and all that kind of stuff, but mm -hmm. they just didn't sound the same on flute, you know? Yeah. So uh, James, when I 
when I went down to a Pomona to the black pre pre freshman program, um, I got with James and said, "Look, you know, I gotta, this is what I have to do for this audition." And so we went through it, and uh, you know, I said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go and we'll, we'll work out a few things. We'll work on this WC thing, and then we'll work on this uh, on this uh, on Faray. And then, uh, it worked out really well, and I passed, and I was so happy. And uh, and so as soon as I got into Pomona, the first thing I did was uh, I got the big band director fired somehow. Well. The guy, we had a little money in the, uh, that they had saved up from the year before, and the guy decided that they wanted to invest it in some armbands for the big band and some of those hats, those little straw hats. Oh, my God. This is, you know, it's not that long ago. This is 73, you know. Okay. But, but I was like, I said to the cast. Oh, you know, I, I'm sorry to interrupt arm you. Bands. you know, yeah, you know those they're arm like bands? garters almost. Yeah, you're like the, garters. The Dixieland. You know. Dixieland. Yeah, they're Dixieland. All right. So they wanted to go in this Dixie thing, you know. And I was like, oh, man, you know, I was the only uh, guy that, well, I was the only black guy that was, uh, that, that was in, the, in the stage band. So I said, well, look, um, I went to the to the director, Mr. Russell, uh, to the head of the music department. I said, you know, this is not really jazz. What what, what this guy is trying to do, and I have I don't even know this guy, but I, I think that we need a real jazz guy if it's going. We're going to have a jazz stage band, so uh, I suggested that he maybe should interview Bobby Bradford, our, our uh, and John John Carter. But John John Carter was already teaching somewhere. So was Bobby. He was teaching at Pasadena CC. And at another college, and and uh, John Carter was teaching at an, another college in Carver. Uh, so uh, Bobby came in. He did an interview, and he just, you know, Bobby Bradford is great. He's a great educator, and uh, so Bobby got the gig. Uh, he he just retired last year. You know, all from years, and and like and and and, and it got to be uh, well known, and people would come from other schools to be in that stage band. Mm -hmm after Bobby had really got the program on the road. So I was always happy that I was responsible for mm -hmm. uh, get, making the petition to get the other guy fired to get Bobby in place so that we could actually have jazz at Pomona College. Mm -hmm. and, and now they're proud of it. They're proud of the fact that they had jazz. That was the beginning of jazz yeah. at Pomona College. I see. Yeah. Otherwise, they were doing the Dixieland uh, yeah. the, the, the routine. We were gonna die in that, man. You know, you know. Now, you know, kids aren't go for, aren't gonna go for that. Right. You know, kids are, they they would never do that now. Yeah. Kids, you know. Uh, you had mentioned um, transcribing solos and stuff, and and how today there's so much more in the way of resources. Is it making a difference for? young jazz musicians to have all those resources? Well, <clears throat> I would say that uh, there's, there's so much information out here right now that I think the kids are bombarded with so much information. Um, they have so much at their fingertips that sometimes they just don't know where to start, you know. Um, it used to be that you know you you you'd hear something come out you you immediately go to your record player slow it down to 16 and a half and the octave be an octave down and you transcribe it then you got trained solo there it is you got Sonny Rollins solo you know and and Bobby Bradford uh after when he told me when they when when bird you when bird came out those guys, in Fast Navarro, those cats, they would go in Texas. They would go and do the same thing. Oh man, we heard a we heard a bird uh, did a solo. Man, everybody ran out, got the record, and transcribed it. And so, by the time you know Bird came their way, the, all the cats knew a solo. Mm -hmm. They were singing a solo. You know, they had it. I don't I don't hear that kind of enthusiasm now, even though all these solos are already transcribed for everybody. So like, you know, like sometimes when I do a class, uh, I'll say, okay, I want you guys to learn this solo up to this point. You know, with, uh, you know uh, give me, uh, you know, six courses, you know, and it was like, oh, you know, like, do we gotta? I said, well, you know, 
fact is, you know, if if we were back in those times, you know, overnight this cat would have the solo. We'd have a solo. We might stay up all night to get that solo. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing was about memorizing the solo, not not just playing the solo, but memorizing mm -hmm. the solo. You know, these kids they they look in the book and play it, and then I say, okay, now play it without the book. Oh, really? You want me to do that? Yeah, when I say play the solo, I mean play it by memory, mm -hmm. like it's a head, because it's written so it should be a head to you. It's just longer. Mm. That's all it is, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, like, uh, and then there's the other thing, when you tell a kid to, uh, to go study a song, you know, they'll, they'll just get the head, and then the reason it's important to play the solo, too, so you understand what the mechanics of the chord changes at a certain tempo what they what they do I mean that's that's the reason we learn solos anyway mm -hmm. but then we have to teach them to learn them to forget them that's how, how I teach you learn the solo and get it in your head you get them down you maybe take 12 solos and learn all of them and then but what you're not what you're learning is really the techniques inside the solo instead of that solo itself so after you've learned them a couple of years go by then you forget them but they put that stuff in your back pocket. It's there. It'll, it'll come out when you mm -hmm. need it. It's, but don't, you know, don't when you play on on uh, jam sessions and on gigs. It's not important to play these solos back. That's not the thing, you know. And and that's where some of the kids don't understand that if they go to New York and start playing at the jam sessions, if they play these solos back, everybody's gonna be bored to death. Uh huh. You know, but what you need to do is develop your style out of what you learn in these solos. So I think as educators, that's the thing that we have to teach them, uh, which is to, is, to, is to use these as, as little guidelines, not verbatim. That step of trying to go from learning all that material and then forming your own sound seems to be a big thing with... Uh, in, in the jazz community, I know like, especially talking to, to real veteran guys in their 70s and 80s, and, and they'll listen to the current players, they seem to think that they're cookie cutter, uh, you know, they're, they're all sounding the same. They're sounding the same. I, I, and, I, and I think, uh, I, I agree with them. Um, I think the reason is, is because they've got so much information and they don't know how to, uh, um, how to just, uh, how do you say, edit, just, it. edit all this information inside. You know, they have, to, they have to be able to get all these things in order to have certain techniques, but they have to use that to get to who they are. They have to go inside. What, what kids have to do is they have to start writing music themselves. They have to learn late. When I came to New York, the way I learned, um, I had learned a lot of bebop and all that before I got to New York. Um, and so when I got to New York, I kept studying, kept studying. I'm always stud I study bebop even now, just to keep sharp, you know, just to read something. You know, you get up in the morning and um, go through the, the Omni book. You know, um, when I when I first when I when you go back to a, the um, when I go back to the Omni book, it takes you days to go through it. Now it takes me an hour to go through it. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's like that. All those books are like that. You should be able to go through them in about 45 minutes after you have done. You do it every day. Then just throw it away for a while. Just get, okay, just, just leave that one alone. Do, you know, you learn stuff to forget it. Uh, I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but jazz musicians say that all the time. You're keeping. The concepts, yes, but not not the actual no, lines. No, no, you don't want to be you somebody. Can. You want to be who you are, and I and I really think like uh, when I came to New York, I started writing a lot, and I learned about myself through, um, like I do a piece. I'll do a piece like morning song or something like that, or any song. And uh, next thing I do an octet arrangement. The next thing I do a big band arrangement of the same song. And so in that, I'm learning about, about music through my song, you know, through my own song. I, I suggest to most kids that they should, they should write their own music and then put it through a couple of different keys and really start to understand what their music 
can teach them about themselves. And then they're getting closer to finding out who they are. And, and in this process, playing your own stuff on the horn, playing for hours and hours of your own ideas, that's when you start to get up there with the Ornette Coleman's and the, and the, the Birds and the, and the Sonny Rollins's and the, and the Clifford Jordans and all these people. You know, that, that kind of time that you spend just working out your own personal ideas. That's how you get a sound by working like that. I mean, like, for instance, like, you know, I don't know if a lot of people know it or not, but Ben Webster, you know, I, I met an old girlfriend of Ben Webster, and she saw, he's telling me, she said, you know, when Ben was living up here in Scandinavia, he used to only practice on baritone. He wouldn't play the tenor until he came to the gig. Wow. You know, you know, there's ways, you know, I mean, that'll get you a sound. It's like, <laughs> It's like running with weights on your feet yeah, and you're taking you know, them off. Yeah, you know, basketball players, they run around with these weight vests and things, and they take them off, and they're, like, they're gone, you know. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's ways to get to yourself, you know, uh -huh. and you've you got to use everything that's there. You can't just think you could just get a concept out of a book. Mm -hmm. That's somebody else's concept. That's not yours. You've got to work hard to develop. And, um, and I think the whole thing with conceptualizing who you want to be seeing yourself in the future, seeing, seeing a composition, writing a composition like, you know, like all these great composers, you know, it, it takes time and it takes a, a lot of uh, thinking power to envision something that's not completed, uh, something way down the road to see a, to write a piece for a year and, 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 and figure out what that is, you know. After that year is up, you know, you've seen, you've seen the end before, but in the middle of that process, you learned a lot about you. You have to force yourself to make these projects happen for yourself. You know, I do that all the time. I, I put, I put uh, limitations on myself, and um, I put. Um, I, always, I always have a goal to uh, as far as what I want to, what I want to accomplish. Like the last thing that I that I did was, uh, I went to Cuba. I, I, it's, it's the third time I recorded in Cuba. The first time I recorded a Cuban big band, some Cuban cats, and I brought a few Americans. The second time I recorded a string album with in Cuba, but I, you know, I used ten Cuban string players, but the music is, has nothing to do with Cuba. It's jazz. I just used the string players because I found that the Cuban string players uh, had a little bit more rhythm when it came to executing my, my, uh, my parts. Uh, my string parts, and and this last recording, I I used some people from Guadeloupe, and I took them to Cuba, and we recorded in Cuba, and uh, I used Cuban horn players, but not to solo, only to play play my lines. So um, I, that's a project that I'm, that, and then I put Pharaoh Saunders on it the other day as a guest artist, and now I'm going up to Montreal to mix it uh, tonight after I finish the concert. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I've seen last year and I've been writing little lines and then when I got down to Cuba it all came together to me okay I have to put what I was I have to I've, I've had this band together for four years uh, it was called the Guoca Masters and uh, Guoca means the car drum from Guadalupe that's the drum that the, they had on the, on the slave ships and and uh, they had a little tin around the side and they, when, they, when they got to uh, Guadalupe and the slaves, they seen all these drum barrels. They put a skin on it and that became their drum. It's a car drum. They named the music after it. So it's the Guoca Masters because it's Guadalupe. So, um, so I envisioned putting that, that concept of the machete and the bula drum, which is tuned by your bare foot hitting on the skin while you play it, and the other one you play upright. You know, uh, putting that with jazz, putting that with my kind of jazz, uh, putting that with my octet version of, of, of what I do. Uh, so now I'm calling it the Guotet, which means nothing to anybody but me. Mm -hmm. But these are the kind of, this is my world. I mean, this is my, all my world. And nobody cares about it but me. But when it I comes out and they hear that, they say, whoa, what a concept. And, uh, but for me, that was a work in progress, and it still is. You know, it's just growing in my mind. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out how to incorporate jazz into, and then there's the music, and then there's the singing on top, which is in Creole, 
which is something that we, probably not, we might not understand here, what they understand in New Orleans is the French Creole. You know, it's a version of, uh, you know, most people from Guadalupe are from Guinea. So you hear this accent, it's African, and then it's, then it's partly Caribbean too. And then it, it's me, so there's American, it's jazz, it's these different things. To me, that's what's interesting about jazz right now, is that I could, I could um, use my influence to do anything I want. You're influenced musically, or your well, my my expertise, whatever expertise that I've developed in jazz, me personally, mm -hmm. I could take that and um, use Ornette Coleman's concept and James Blood Omer. They say jazz is the teacher, and funk is the preacher. So, in other words, when you say funk, you mean you. I'm, I think they mean that you have to include the young, and that's the way to bring in the young because. The guy who's got the the vocal box is the one. It's like it's like rap, you know. Eventually, jazz and rap have to get a little closer together than it is even now, because that's what the kids are listening to. Mm -hmm. And if you're gonna want an audience in the next hundred years, you're gonna have to do something besides play with your quartet mm -hmm. to bring that on. Yeah. So, I feel like I'm doing that now. I'm trying to bring other people in, you know, because jazz is jazz is a it's, it, it's such a free music that it includes everybody. And everybody seems like they can put their two cents in. So, you know, um, I'm putting mine in too. You know. But jazz is a teacher. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and every other music uh, is the preacher to whoever, that their whoever their constituents are. You know. I see. How much of what you do when you decide on a project is um, driven by economic realities oh does God. that stop you oh yeah man because I'm, I'm always I'm always having to deal with that like for instance um, okay I come up with a wonderful concept I wanna I, I'll say to my uh, my agent you know I have this idea about doing something with two choirs and a big band you know <laughs> okay so, uh, okay well how about like uh, two singers and eight guys in the band you know I mean yeah, you know sure. I mean Okay, well, that's, that's, that's knocked down every day, every day. Like right now, uh, I was invited to, uh, to Seattle to play at a concert with my Latin big band. And it's, you know, they, they only want to pay a fee, you know. They'll pay the transportation, but not from Cuba. Uh, you know, there's problems with Cuba anyway. Okay, I was going to bring, get some Latin cats from New York. That's even impossible. So now I have to rewrite the music so that so that it actually is an octet. Oh, for that one gig. For that one gig. Yeah. So now I've got to write uh, uh, albums, I have to arrange an album's worth of music to play at this festival, you know, and trunk, either truncate what, I, what I've done with the big band and make it smaller. I mean, you can't use the same music. It's going to sound like crap, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, any arranger knows that. If you, you just have to do it over again. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's not going to sign. So that's work. That's serious work. You know, that's, to me, that's two weeks of work right mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. just for this one gig. Yeah. You know, and to, and, to that, and to this booker, they just said, well, it's a gig. I said, yeah, but, you know, you've got to give me more for that. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, it's like uh, the Nice Jazz Festival. They, they wanted to give me some money to do a, um, they wanted me to rewrite, uh, Porgy and Bess. Uh, and it was like, you know, the money was sizable. I mean, it was like $25,000. And uh, I looked at my schedule and I said, finally I said, no. Because, you know, for me to, for me to change, I mean, that would like change my life, you know, for the next six months. Uh -huh. For me to rewrite Porgy and Bess. You'd have to stop. For one gig, man. Yeah. I couldn't do it. I had to say, no, I'm, I can't. Because, I mean, I'm not going to just, I, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it half-assed yeah. because uh, then I'd have a bad reputation hmm. for that. So I just said, I, it's the first time I said no. I, no, I can't do it. Well, wow. got to get the next guy. Nature of the business seems to be that everybody's got multiple projects, and I can imagine how hard it must be to 
get the people you want for either recording or to do those concerts. Yeah, well, you know what I've uh, what what I've done is um, I have a nucleus, um, and my nucleus is my quartet: um, Hamid Drake and Jaribu Shahid, as a as a trio. I mean, those two guys are pretty much my nucleus in everything that I'm doing right now. So when the rhythm section is strong, um, you seem like you could build anything around it. Mm -hmm. It's like you got your motor, and you and you got your steering wheel, and you got, uh, all you need is, a, a, you know, some seats and a chassis, <laughs> you know, and then yeah. in the ornaments and horns and brake lights and stuff, you can yeah. put around it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good analogy. <laughs> yeah. Let me play, um, we had talked about this particular song, and um, in the 80s, Can you tell me where this particular song came from, or do you get inspiration from any particular place? I call that song Morning Song because this, it was a song that I heard my mother play. She would, my father was a garbage man, and a lot of nights he would kneel down to pray. He'd go to bed fairly late to be, to be getting up at five o'clock. Mm. Sometimes I'd, I'd see him on his knees. I'd go to the bathroom late at night, and He's, he would actually be asleep in the middle of his prayers. Oh. And then it's five o'clock and I know he had to get up right off his knees and, and go to work. And my mother would get up and you know try to get him out the house and as soon as she got him out the house, she, that was her quiet time and that's, this was the time when she would practice. And this is what I heard during this okay. time. That's why I call it morning song because it's the music I heard in the morning. Every morning I heard this. That's a great story. It, and it sounds like even the same song or something. Mm. It's like it's like a recurring thing she used to do. And to me it sounds like that. And she would sing too. And it's got a couple sections to it. It goes into a swing thing yeah. eventually. Yeah, that's, it, 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 it takes everybody out because it's like 16, 17, 16. That's the form. Oh. <laughs> you know. There's no coasting on it. You gotta like. Oh no no, that seventeenth okay. bar get you if you're not <laughs> if you're not if you're not on, on it. And I then see. there's a one two bar. Bo dee da da bo dee da do 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 dee da da bo dee ba da ba 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 dee 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 ba ba da da dee da ba da ba da. That part da da ba da ba that's a one two. I see. Doom 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 your back. So. Did you do that because you had a melody going and you needed to put in an let's let's call it an odd measure to accommodate the melody? Yeah. Um because to me the melody is the strongest thing. Mm -hmm. Um I mean I think I write strong melodies because I I concentrate on melodies. You know, melodies are what you know, what makes the song, I mean, if you don't have, you could have chords going, but uh, the chords, I, I, I prefer to write a melody before I write the structure. Uh, it dictates the structure as, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Because, uh, you know, in the end, it's the melody that people are going to be whistling walking down the street. Yeah. And a lot of people have told me that they wake up in the middle of the night whistling some of my songs. Mm. Um, if I didn't write in that way, I don't know if they w would whistle whistle uh, somebody's rhythms, you know. Right. I, yeah. Some about melody, you know, it's, a, it's, it's it changes you. That's a, a great compliment, I think, when people say, you know, that tune you wrote, I just got it in my head. Yeah, I can't get it out, you know. <laughs> I think that's great. And, uh, you know, emotion is something, too. Uh, speaking of compliments, the biggest compliment that I ever had was I did a string concert one time uh, at the Public Theater in New York. And uh, I took the opportunity to, uh, I did all ballads. It was you know, me with strings, but it was all ballads. So I, like a couple of years after that, I'm walking down 
St. Mark's place, a couple comes up to me and they say, you see this kid? This kid was conceived after that concert. And that was, that was, that was like the highest, you know, uh -huh. I was exalted. That was, that was it. I, they, 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 they knighted me right there. I, I was, that was, you know, I was, I was, I'm still going from that. You That's know. great. So, you know, if that, if that human being came out of, uh, of my string ballad concert, I mean, there were actually people weeping in the mm -hmm. concert. You know, some about strings that can make you yeah. go into it. Especially if you, it, it, you know. It, but the whole thing is to do it without it being maudlin. You know, it can be, it can be contrived. You know, strings can be, you can be cornball city with strings too. You mm -hmm. know, especially if you approach it from the ballad thing, because you know. Anyway, and that's a, I don't know the whole thing about melody and song form. There's a, there's a battle in the in the society right now because everybody is more conditioned to hearing beats and uh, the song form is getting the licking right now. You know, when a, when a guy like Stevie Wonder can't come up with a hit, you know, he's a real songwriter. I mean, I'm speaking in the black community particularly right now. When, uh, when the community is, is like uh, hoodwinked into thinking that this is only music. Is the, this these beats and this rap is this is what we call music now, and this other stuff is maudlin and and contrived because it is a melody. It sounds like to them like somebody's in a in a theater and then all of a sudden they break in the song, you know, and it's corny. No, it's not corny. It's mm. a song. Mm. You know, songs will always be back, but it's not here right now. And. Uh, I think I'm waiting for the time when the songwriter in the community will raise his head again. You know, I look forward to that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting uh, when you think about what are the songs. I occasionally play like weddings and stuff, mm -hmm. and people seem to be, even young people now, gravitating towards the older songs because what can they pick that's current? To play at a function like that, yeah, you know, like I, yeah, exactly. Like when they, you play at weddings these days. I mean, I haven't played at weddings, but I, I've got two sisters that are getting married, and they're gonna always play "I Will Always Love You" and these kind of songs, you know. Mm -hmm. And but those songs are old now; they're not current stuff. I mean, like, what do you do? I mean, what are you gonna do? A rap? You know, <laughs> I love you, baby, because you know. Yeah, I mean, what are you <laughs> gonna do? And even the the rappers, they they tried the whole thing with. We're dealing with songs from the '80s and putting it with the rap. Mm -hmm. Now they're writing these little, sh these real, these real little short, not songs even. They're like hooks. They do the rap, and then they put these little hooks in it. Mm -hmm. uh, they leave these little hooks inside. Uh, you know, I love you, baby, and then the old guy starts rapping. And then they go back and forth. <laughs> yeah. But it's not really a song. It's just like a, a eight bar, mm -hmm. a four bar phrase of a song. So I think, they're, I think they're moving towards getting back to songwriting. And uh, this, this young kid, Pharrell, is, is starting to, the guy who's got the number one hit. I seen him mm -hmm. Saturday night in Central Park. Uh, and uh, um, this guy, Pharrell, uh, with the nerd, N-E-R-D. Oh. They, he started, he's, he's, he's beginning to do that. He's starting to bring the song form mm -hmm. back in to the rap. And so, and there was a point in this concert the other night that I almost wanted to hear rap. I was like, well, when are they going to start rapping again? Uh -huh. Because he was doing it up. You know, he was, he was actually singing songs. I mean, he was singing like in the smoky style. Mm -hmm. But it was against almost like he had a band that wasn't a, really a jazz band. It wasn't a soul band. It was more like a rock band, the NERD. Um, so anyway, kids like him, I think, are the brighter kids that mm -hmm. are doing music in my son is uh, is into um, into making beats and into writing songs. He just did a he just did a, a wonderful um, he did some beats and a, kind of like a use like a like a music scape of like Skies of America or Nick Coleman. Oh, and uh, you know this is he, he he's he's trying to he wants to be a producer. Mm -hmm. So this is a kid I'm talking about maybe trying to get up here. Yeah, because you know, he, when he comes up here he'll he'll like the place up too. Yeah. you know uh -huh. he's he's. he's uh, Quite a, quite a brilliant kid. That's great. 
But the future is, is, is in these kids that want to learn how to be musicians. See, 10 years ago, I would hear rappers get on the, t on the radio and say, well, you know, these days we don't have to be musicians. And he was bragging, they were bragging the fact, this as a fact. I was like, boy, these guys, they, yeah. they sound so ignorant that, you know, I don't even want to listen to him rap anymore. Mm -hmm. if, if that's the way he speaks, yeah. you know. But uh, that's the future, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rule the rappers out because it's been around for a long time. Um, but I'm just I'm just thinking it's time for them to learn some music, and mm -hmm. I think Pharrell and these young some of these young kids are not gonna move it on out. Yeah. yeah. I want to briefly just ask you about your experience with the Grateful Dead. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, uh, God. Um, first of all, Bob Weir is a really a good friend of mine, and. Uh, the way we met was through Michael Nash and Kerry Williams. Uh, they asked me to be part of uh, of this uh, of writing uh, the music for um, uh, a musical about Satchel Page. And so we began to collaborate. Taj Mahal, and Bob Weir, and myself, Michael Nash, and Kerry were, were writing the libretto. Um, and it's it's been a process now that's been going on for seven years. You know. And um, I, I think we're gonna. We've had several workshops. We've had Avery Brooks come in and direct us. Uh, we've had several directors come in and do workshops. And I think maybe approaching ten years, it's gonna eventually be out there on Broadway. Mm -hmm. We have thirty-five songs, and um, we've realized ourselves as, as, as pretty good songwriters. I think the the music is far ahead of the script, and they, they're doing revisions of the script. And um, this brought me into uh, the whole idea of, uh, of like, you know, them saying, well, hey, David, why don't you, we're playing at Madison Square Garden, why don't you come and sit in? I said, okay, well, all right, I'll sit in, I'll be down. So I come and sit in, you know, bam, it's like 20,000 people there, and I've never seen such an atten attentive audience. I mean, I, you know, I play and play at the Vanguard and this, this jazz club, that jazz, Blue Notes and all this. You know, there's always somebody talking at the bar that I could hear, usually a musician, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and, I, I, and I play, I say, wow, on my sax, and I see all the heads, like, oh, wow. They're with me the whole time. Uh -huh. uh, what a wonderful audience these guys have developed, you know. And I was just thinking, man, I wish, wish, uh, wish we had a, such a dedicated crew of, uh, especially 20,000 of them, you know. So then I go sit, them, I sit in with them uh, out in San Francisco, same thing. And then I played one other time with them, and uh, I, you know, I know I played with Jerry Garcia's band at at the uh, I sat in with him at the Madison Square Garden, and that was a gas too, because this guy is, was fantastic. Then he dies, you know, and right in the middle of this time, and it's just incredible that I mean I, I never got paid a dime to to play with them, but but what I did get. Um, was uh, was uh, all this recognition from uh, from all these people? Mm -hmm. Every time I play a concert, somebody come in with a shirt like this and and say, "Play one for Jerry, Dave," you know. And mm -hmm. I'm like, "Okay." And so I did it. I did it. Then I did an album of their music mm -hmm. because they were just such really such nice people. I was like, "Well, hey, let me take your music and put it in the jazz thing. Let's mm -hmm. let's let's put this together and let me put this with my octet. See what that'll do." And it was a very successful album. People loved it, and all after that, I was like in their camp, you know. So they're, they're now the dead is back together. Um, Phil Les just got a new liver. Um, they're back in it, man. Kreisman came back, and Billy Hart is he's 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 back, and you know they they had to have Kreisman because Billy he could play a lot of things, but uh -huh. time is not one of them. <laughs> but now they got Billy to play the time, so now they're they're really back because okay. he had really retired. Yeah. So that's why they're back because yeah. Billy came back. I see. So, um, and I, God bless them. I love those guys. Uh -huh. I mean, and, and the thing is so deep is that I went in a, a bookstore, and they got all these. Uh, they have all of these, these new editions, these new books about Jerry Garcia. And that's like I, I, I counted like fourteen of them, and I'm on like several pages mm -hmm. of every one of them, just because of those few situations that I just spoke of. And so it's like, it's a cult thing, man. It's, you know, yeah. It's, I, w I will I always be connected with mm -hmm. these people. And, it's in the, and we're talking about doing some stuff now, you know. 
That's great. You seem to have the most wide open ears I can imagine. Even Berkeley, listening, man. Yeah, Berkeley, okay. <laughs> it, it really is Berkeley, man. Yeah. I, you know, I don't have any control over that. And, yeah. and I think it's just the way I grew up. Yeah. I, I couldn't, I couldn't be any other way, you know. Uh, you know, right now I'm trying to hear stuff, you know, like like being in Paris. I hear all kind of stuff. There's a 24 year old guitar player that's from Senegal. His kid name, his name is Hervé Samba, and his mother's Vietnamese, and uh, he's and he's a mixed kid. This kid, I think. If there's another Jimmy, he's he's gonna be it. I I never seen anybody like that. So there's people all over the world, man. That you could see and you know. I just wanna. I just tell the guy. I says, I'm gonna I'll make sure. I'm gonna make sure you always owe me money. Because <laughs> one day they're gonna give you some. Because this kid is incredible, you know. So he's, he comes out on the road. He never he never wants to spend his money. So I always like okay, I'll give. You. But I always really? keep a tab on him. Uh huh. That I just always want to make sure I owe, that you always owe me money because, you know, they're going to give you a bunch of it one day. Mm -hmm. I hope you, you take care of it. That's good. Mm. It's good to have those kind of people in your back pocket. Yeah, but I'm <laughs> trying to collect these people all over the world. Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, it's not in New York where you find everybody. There's other places mm -hmm. where you find people that it's like one of a kind. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a few people like that on this planet. And I'm trying to assemble them. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of what I'm trying to do. There's, there's some, there's some talents down in Cuba, man, that are untouched, untapped. You know, it's, there's a few great people, great bands that people haven't even heard. You know, like this guy Manolito Simonette, he's a great. This guy's always got like the number two hit in Cuba. You know, they ain't you even hear about him up here. Hmm. I'm not sure if I can phrase this question, but I'll try. If I was to take. Uh, a solo of yours and transcribe it and then match what you're playing against the chord structure mm -hmm. and try to justify everything you're playing by saying notice how David you know took the tritone substitution and, and all mm -hmm. that yeah yeah would that be legitimate or are some of the things you do uh, happy accidents. Happy accidents. That's a good, good, good uh, way to put it. Well, let's put it like this. Um, I remember when uh, when they came out with my first transcription of uh, I had uh, recorded Body and Soul, and uh, I remember coming home and um, putting it next to Coleman Hawkins, and then putting it the page bar by bar next to Coleman Hawkins solo. And playing through mine, playing through his, playing through mine, playing through his, and then I realized that you know that um, what I was doing. I mean, uh, uh, on a solo like that, you could because in that particular solo, I was pretty much playing uh, in a more um, traditional kind of way. Mm -hmm. uh, it depend on which solo you transcribed. If it was a song where I just took off. Then um, I'm not sure that um, the chord changes at one point. Sometimes when I'm playing, sometimes the chord changes become become um, more like uh, not not necessarily uh, that I'm not following the chord changes because I am, but I'm playing I'm playing across the chord changes uh, through the harmonic series. Um, that would probably be very difficult to transcribe and, and be accurate as far as what I'm thinking when I'm playing. Mm -hmm. Now, um, a happy accident, mm, I'm not sure accident would describe it because I always know, I always know where I am. Now, maybe other people might not think I know where I am, but I'm always, uh, I, when I'm playing the, with songs that have chords, um, I'm very aware of the of the chord structure. I'm challenging that that structure is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to defy it. I'm trying very hard to defy it and dispel it at the same time that I'm playing it. Um, perhaps it sounds like an accident because I'm covering some new ground on it. And usually I would have probably played that song 
so many times before it got to that recording that I'm playing across that song like I own that song. That song is, and it probably is mine anyway, uh -huh. you know. So I feel like, well, I can do anything with my own song that I want to. And this is how I want the final result to sound like. So uh, be it, uh, be it uh, somebody else's idea of an accident or a train wreck or whatever, fine, if you want to call it that, that's cool. But that's exactly what I was trying to, to get to. Otherwise, I wouldn't have let it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't have let that version come out. I see. So that's pretty much the way I see it. I, 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 I feel like w what I'm trying to do as a soloist is to um, stretch the boundaries. Because to, for to me, everybody that comes from New York, um, each person that comes in, each soloist comes in, they set the bar a little higher. And they challenge people to think a different way. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to let people think a different way about how, could, how they could approach even playing chord changes. Yeah, it's a great answer. I like the way you describe it's it. It's the truth. Think, yeah. <laughs> well, what's in the near near future for you? You're mixing another album, and well, uh, the near future is to mix this album. Um, I'm playing Carnegie Hall on the 14th with my quartet with strings. I'm using 10, this time I'm using 10 string players from New York. I hope they execute as well as the mm -hmm. Cubans. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm going to do this gig in Seattle that I have to waste my time on doing. Um, I probably uh, will do a recording with uh, Taj Mahal and uh, Ishmael Reed, another conjure with Kip Hanrahan. I think that's on the books for October. Um, November, December, I'll just probably be doing some gigs with the Gokai Masters, and um, this 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 little period of time right in here, I'm concentrating on getting my kid into a, a, a decent college. Um, we'll see. Maybe I'll end up here. Maybe so. Be happy to have you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been a fascinating talking to you and having you on campus. And, uh, oh, I'm, I'm looking forward very to very creative the man and. Uh, Wow, this is a great you. place to be, and I'm, I'm happy to have done this interview with you. Good. Thank you. All right. Look forward That's to the great. dinner.